So welcome to this, the uh, Anatomy seminar. Um, welcome to all of those of you from around the world, from Asia, South Asia, the Middle East, uh, Europe and, and Africa who are joining us this morning. Um, this is part of a, an ongoing series where experts from Altamimi's construction and infrastructure disputes team look at some issues arising on construction contracts from, from around our region. So today's presenters are my colleague Ewan Lloyd, who's uh, in our Abu Dhabi office. Um, Ewan has responsibility for, for particularly uh, the UAE and, and uh, the Kingdom of Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Myself, I've got a I'm based in Qatar, Doha, uh, and I have a responsibility generally across uh, Al Tamimi's uh, nine offices. So next slide, please. So what are we actually going to do today? Um, we're, what we anticipate over the series is that we will have speakers from throughout Al Tamimi's offices. Uh, identifying the differences and similarities, uh, whether, um, uh, whether in, in Egypt, Jordan, Kuwait, Qatar, the UAE or Saudi, and then also comparing and contrasting with, with the regions which you may be more familiar with, particularly perhaps common law jurisdictions or, or alternatively, maybe some of the jurisdictions in, in, uh, in Asia. Our purpose is to address those issues which you have and one of the things that we really want to emphasize in this series is that we very much understand that a, a lot of you aren't necessarily trained as lawyers. Uh, and even if you are, you, you may well be working in, in English, which isn't necessarily going to be your, your first language. And that you may be unfamiliar with, with the legal issues that are, uh, are present in, in the GCC. So we're, we're, we're really looking to compare contrast with what we know such that you're in a position where you can compare and contrast with what you know in order that your knowledge is, is expanded and that you're in a better position to, to understand the, the risks and liabilities that you've got in your construction contracts. Um, so in each episode or each, each uh, event, what we're looking to do is choose two topics and we'll go through them reasonably quickly um, with this very uh, intention of looking at it from both an employer perspective, from a main contractor perspective, and also from a, from a subcontractor perspective. Uh, and, and hopefully you'll come away from each of these with, with as I say, a better understanding, um, both for the purposes of uh, your existing negotiations that you may be involved in at the moment, your uh, uh, contracts that already exist, and indeed in, in respect of, of future negotiations. Because being forewarned, forearmed, you can understand and hopefully have a more uh, informed dialogue with those people with whom you're negotiating or with whom you're working on a, on a daily basis. So uh, next, uh, next slide, please. So uh, we'll be running through these uh, five, five uh, topics. So um, the, I've gone through the introductions, purpose and approach. I'll then be dealing with the back-to-back -back provisions aspects and uh, you and that will be dealing with, uh, with the ancillary project documents part. Uh, hopefully we'll have a little bit of time for some questions and then I'll, I'll just touch on the, um, the, the, the next event. So next slide, please, going straight into back-to-back. -back. <clears throat> so why is it that we've chosen this as, as an issue? Um, well, the, the short point is that uh, it comes up time and time again. And currently we're involved in a number of different disputes, uh, both here in Qatar, but also across the region, where back-to-back uh, -back provisions uh, have become part of, of the dispute. Um, we see various versions of what are back-to-back -back provisions, but one thing that is often uh, overlooked is that actually the back-to-back -back provisions are there. Um, sometimes they can be concealed in, in the contract, not deliberately, but just uh, are overlooked by, by the parties. Um, but then the second point is that once you've found your back-to-back -back clause, uh, the clause is often ambiguous and, and confusing. And it's, it's some of these ambiguities and confusions that we're, we're looking to, to pick up on today. So next clause, please. So within any back-to-back -back 
provision, you will usually see that there are several component parts, one of which is an obligation in relation to performance. The next is in relation to liability and recoverability. And then finally, and it's less frequent, but, it, but it's definitely uh, in there more and more frequently, um, is, is this question of, of contingency. So none of these uh, component parts are of themselves unreasonable, um, possibly uh, with the exception of the last one, uh, equivalent project relief. Um, but it's how they're drafted, which may or may not have uh, the hidden consequences that we're referring to in the title of, of today's, uh, today's seminar. And these, are, uh, the, these issues are relevant to both main contractors and, and, and to the subcontractors. So, next slide, please. So what we've got here is, is just a couple of examples of the sort of thing which uh, is, is, is within the concept of a of a back to back provision. Um, and what we've what we've actually got here is what is in, in common law terms would be a blurring of the lines of the concept of privity of contract, which which some of you may, may well be familiar with, certainly the lawyers. And that is that the contract that you, the two parties have is to govern their relationship. But when you start trying to bring into a, a subcontract elements of the main contract, that's where it becomes uh, less clear as to whether or not uh, the, the obligations in that subcontract are really included in the terms and conditions of that subcontract or whether you have to go and start looking elsewhere. Now, a very important point, and I'm not sure if any of you are aware of it, there's a bit of research that has been done by um, one of the claims consultants called HKA, this is called the Crux Report, C-R-U-X. And what that looks at is um, the basis for disputes in all sorts of regions. And one of the things, one of the themes across all regions, but um, it's particularly alighted upon in relation to the uh, Middle East and Africa section, is that simply the parties don't properly understand, firstly, the scope of the works that they've undertaken, who is responsible for what, and secondly, there is a, um, a, a lack of understanding of, of where, the, uh, where, where one liability starts and uh, another liability uh, begins, uh, finishes rather. Um, so what these clauses are doing, as I say, is, is starting to mix up uh, what, is the, what are the liabilities. Um, and you can see that in both of these clauses, you've got uh, th those elements that I've referred to of performance, uh, responsibility. Uh, there isn't in these clauses the, the uh, contingent element. I'll, I'll come on to that in a different context. But you can see that um, th the theme is there, or the themes are there. But what, what they're actually what, what they've actually drafted is something which which goes beyond and potentially is very confusing. Because what one you, what you have to remember is that simultaneously with including these sorts of clauses in the subcontract, there are probably negotiations going on about what are the terms and conditions of the subcontract. And what we find frequently is that potentially what you've got is you've got the two parties being unaware that they're both working on a different set of terms and conditions. The main contractor is often thinking that all of the terms and conditions that it has entered into with the employer have been incorporated into the subcontract, whereas the subcontractor is focusing on the terms and conditions that are uh, that, 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 that it's been negotiating. And what we're trying to emphasize here is it, it, it's not that one is right or wrong. It is make sure that you have the dialogue with the other party in order that you both understand exactly what, what is intended. Because I mean, just to give a typical example in relation to, to liquidated damages provisions, quite often the main contractor will be assuming that the liquidated damages figure that they've got in their main contract 
has in some way through back to back clauses like this has actually been passed down to the subcontractor. The subcontractor, on the other hand, is thinking that the liquidated damages that it is exposed to is the liquidated damages that it's included in, in its subcontract. Another example relates to extensions of time. The main contractor has got a list of extension of time reasons uh, in the main contract, and it isn't aware or hasn't necessarily understood that there is a different list in the subcontract. And I go back to, to the research that's been done. Time and time again, what we have in the disputes in the region is where you've got two completely different understandings of how the, the main contract provisions are going to impact upon the subcontract provisions. So what is what, what we're really saying is when you engage with a back-to-back -back provision, it is the onus that there is an onus on both the main contractor and the subcontractor to look at these clauses and understand what are the component parts and in relation to those component parts, who is really going to be doing what? Next slide, please. So to emphasize these points, what you need to be doing at the tender and contract formation stages is making sure that the main contract is available to you as the main contractor and to the subcontractor. And that insofar as there are drafts that are being discussed, that actually it's going to be for both parties benefit that the final version is also discussed before the, the subcontract is signed in order that everybody understands. The next point, and perhaps this is the key one, is do not duplicate terms and conditions. Don't incorporate the main contract conditions so that there's a whole regime which is a, a, a duplicate or not even a duplicate, but doubling up and con, uh, uh, not drafted in the same way as, as the set of terms and conditions that you've agreed in your subcontract. Particularly, this relates to, to notice provisions. Um, again, a, a dispute that arises time and time again is whether or not the subcontractor has complied with the, the appropriate uh, to, uh, notice provisions with, within the main contract. When in fact, what the subcontractor has been doing is looking at the notice provisions in the subcontract. And then, ensure that any provisions are certain as to their effect, agree what is meant and intended. This is for the, for the mutual benefit because some of that wording that I identified in, the, in, the first, uh, in those two examples, actually what it sets out is something which potentially means that the, that the main contractor is just stepping aside and uh, wanting to allow the subcontractor to, to, to engage with the employer in terms of following procedures. Most times that isn't what the main contractor wants to happen, but that's what the contract has said because of the inadvert inadvertent drafting of, of the back-to-back -back provisions. And then in relation to the, the contract administration, ensure that the parties know what these deadlines are in the subcontract and in the main contract in order that the employer is alerted in time such that there is uh, less opportunity, fewer opportunities for the, for, for the employer to avoid liability on the basis of saying that uh, notice provisions haven't been complied with. Because I'm sure, as many of you will know, um, because of the influence of common law, and particularly English drafting on contracts in the region, there are many, many uh, provisions which include uh, what's called a condition precedent component. In other words, you have to issue the notices uh, within the timescales and with the relevant level of detail, because if you don't, then that is stated to be a basis on which the uh, employer can reject the claim, even though there is a substantive basis for it. Uh, and then this 
The final bullet point that I've got on that slide is that both parties understand what are the main contractors' obligations to progress claims and applications. Now, that relates specifically to that uh, component of a back-to-back -back clause that I've referred to already, which is the, uh, the, the, the equivalent project relief concept. Now, um, equivalent project relief is something of a, a fancy English name for basically meaning that the main contractor doesn't have to pay or grant to the subcontractor anything unless it has actually been paid or been granted something by the employer. Now, uh, that clause uh, is, is often hidden away. Um, in the, the GCC, uh, most, um, uh, most main contractors just see it as a, as a, a a right even without an express clause, but um, it sometimes and usually should come with uh, a reciprocal obligation to make sure that any claims which the subcontractor makes are actually passed up the line to the employer. And if the main contractor doesn't do that, well, it itself will be in breach of contract and potentially have a liability which otherwise it could have been able to just uh, uh, pass on to the to the employer. Next slide, please. And so my, my final point is, is really just in relation to uh, the enforceability of, of these provisions. So the first one is relation to in relation to performance. Yes, there's absolutely no reason why in a subcontract, you can't have a back-to-back -back provision which requires the subcontractor to perform the subcontract so as to uh, uh, satisfy the requirements of the main contract. Secondly, in relation to recoverability, uh, and this is a, a not unusual idea, that the uh, main contractor is going to have a remedy against the subcontractor for the damages that it incurs to the employer insofar as the subcontractor is in breach of the subcontract. And then finally, um, the, the point in relation to equivalent, equivalent project relief, and I, I emphasize the point that I've, I've just made, which is that yes, these are enforceable in the GCC. There are some jurisdictions, and one of them is, is the UK, where that sort of back-to-back -back provision has actually been outlawed such that a contractor can't say that it's not going to pay or not going to grant because it hasn't received something from the employer. That's perceived in the, in, in the UK as being a, a, res, a restriction or, which has inhibited uh, the development of the construction industry. However, here in the GCC, it is allowed. Um, I should just mention that in, in, um, in the context of, of that issue, uh, most civil code countries, uh, Qatar as an ex example with um, Article 701 and 702, potentially does give a remedy to the subcontractor against the employer, going direct against the employer for monies which should have been paid to the subcontractor by the main contractor. However, there is one hitch here, and that is that in those circumstances, if if you've got a clause, a back-to-back -back clause, which is, which is uh, enforceable, what it actually means is that the main contractor doesn't have the liability to the subcontractor until there's the payment. In which case, uh, certainly in Qatar, Article 701 and 702 might be, might be difficult to, uh, to enforce. So the summary in relation to all of this is find your back-to-back -back provision, understand what it says, what are the component parts, and then discuss with your contracting party what is it that we really mean by this, and what, in terms of the subcontract obligations, are the limitations which have been negotiated within the subcontract terms and conditions. So, Ewan, over to you. Next slide, please. Thank you very much, Andrew. Um, and 
Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, this seminar. And so, you know, my, my part of, of this seminar is it's, it's, it's entitled Ancillary Project Documents, and um, that's an incredibly, you know, broad, um, broad term, and it could encompass all sorts of things, such as direct agreements, uh, novation agreements, battle warranties, um, even potentially insurance obligations. These may be the subjects of, um, of future uh, webinars in our in our series, but uh, for today, I'm going to talk about uh, bonds and and guarantees. Uh, next slide, please. So, like I say, I'll, I'll kick things off uh, with a bit of a discussion about about performance about performance bonds. Um, and, you know, performance bonds come in all from various kind of forms, if you like. So you've got. Um, in actual performance bonds, but also retention bonds and um, advanced payment guarantees, for example, so all of which are kind of subsets of, of bonds. And I think everybody tuning in today will be kind of pretty familiar and will accept that performance bonds are pretty much a, a fact of life in, in the construction industry in which we, we all operate. Um, and so, you know, so for example, you've got a, a construction contract and, you know, invariably, the under the construction contract, the uh, the contractor will be under a uh, a very clear obligation to um, provide a performance bond uh, in favour of the um, of the employer. And typically, it's it's a fundamental obligation of that construction contract. So if you look at a a FIDIC form of contract, um, if the contractor fails to procure the uh, the provision of a performance bond, well, that can have some fairly uh, radical consequences. So they can they can uh, range from uh, justifying non-payment by the um, by the employer, but it can also trigger a right of, of termination. So that really kind of highlights the importance of performance bonds in the in the construction industry. And you know the value of bonds is, is a matter for commercial negotiation. But typically, uh, a bond would be you know ten percent of, of the contract price, but there may be a provision for the for the value of the bond to to increase as and when the actual value of the contract price increases. It could be an escalation in value. Um, in terms of duration, uh, that's also a matter for negotiation. Yeah, but typically, you know, the bond will be in place from uh, commencement until uh, takeover of the works. But then it wouldn't be uncommon for the bond to remain. In place until the expiry of the uh, defects liability period, and so you know the next kind of question is you know bonds do exist, but then the next question is what kind of bond are we talking about? And fundamentally, bonds come in two forms: uh, an on-demand bond and a default bond. And so, starting first with default bonds, as the name suggests, uh, liquidation of a default of a default bond is contingent upon. Uh, the contractor being in breach or in default of his obligations under the construction contract. I know that sounds very straightforward and and uh, and clear, but then you know the question does arise as to what constitutes a breach and what constitutes a default. And so, for example, is it sufficient for the um, employer to allege that the contractor is in breach, or could it be argued that the contractor isn't particularly uh, objective, his determination may be biased, and so should something more objective be, be required, such as an engineer's determination? Possibly, but then, you know, an engineer's determination under a fitted contract is only valid until that's been revised, so it's a, a temporary, a temporary decision, if you like, and so then you kind of move on to, you know, ask is, 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 is it necessary for the breach to be demonstrated by an arbitral award or, or a court judgment? And these, these questions are extremely arguable. And the only way in which these questions can be addressed if they are kind of clearly addressed under the form of the on-demand, sorry, under, uh, uh, under, under the form of the, um, of, of the actual default bond. That's something which, is, which, which, which sometimes goes unchecked and can be, um, and can be a, a source of, of disputes. Um, but look, in, in, this, in this part of the world, in the, in the Middle East, um, default bonds aren't particularly common um, and invariably uh, market practices for on-demand performance bonds to be provided. And basically, an on-demand performance bond is a, is a fairly, fairly short document. And it basically provides that, you know, immediately upon first demand, 
from the employer, the issuer, i.e. the bank, is required to, to pay out without looking at the underlying circumstances. So, so, so the idea is that the on-demand performance bond is almost uh, as good as cash. And so the on-demand performance bond should be easy to, to liquidate. Um, and typically that, that, that is the case. But, you know, I think a couple of words of caution, you know, so although it is easy to liquidate a on-demand performance bond, um, the overall bigger picture needs to be looked at and, and considered because, you know, liquidating an on-demand performance bond is pretty much a, a declaration of war between the employer and the contractor. It's extremely difficult to kind of salvage a contractual relationship once the uh, bond has been uh, liquidated. So typically, uh, liquidating a performance bond is a precursor to terminating a construction contract. There's also an argument that it's necessary to liquidate a performance bond before terminating the construction contract because the performance bond is an ancillary obligation to the underlying construction contract. So if the construction contract's been terminated, then the bond will, will fall away. That, that's one argument you, you do come across. And then the other issue as well is if in the unusual event that the contract is not terminated and the bond has been liquidated, it will in real terms be very difficult for the contractor to continue to perform its obligations because, you know, once a bond is called, the bank does pay out and then the bank will recover the amount it paid out um, directly from, uh, from the contractor. There will be some underlying security arrangements between the issuing bank and the contractor. And once the once a bond is liquidated, that'll have a dramatic impact on the, on the contractor's uh, cash flow. That, in turn, will uh, prejudice its ability to uh, form under the contract. And so, look, I think it's, I think it's very important that before a bond is, is liquidated, that uh, the commercial ramifications are carefully uh, considered and uh, contingency plans are, are put in place. But, uh, but you know, without wanting to contradict myself, um, at the same time, nothing is 100% crystal clear in construction law. Um, and so, although in theory, it should be easy to liquidate on-demand performance bonds, there are a few kind of wrinkles, if you like. And these kind of wrinkles come in maybe two categories. The first, the first kind of wrinkle, if you like, is, is down to um, negotiation and the way the actual terms of the on-demand bond have been uh, drafted. And so to give you a couple of examples that I recently came across, um, the first was ostensibly a pure on-demand performance bond, uh, other than the insertion of a, of a clause to the effect that although the bond was fully uh, on demand, uh, payment was subject to the contractor's agreement that it, that it should be liquidated. So this wording had been put in, and it totally vitiated the whole purpose of the, of, of, of the whole purpose of the on-demand performance of the on-demand performance bond. And uh, remarkably, this wording had actually got through and had been accepted. And that kind of rendered the uh, on-demand performance bond relatively useless, or at best uh, subject to the uh, subject to the subject to the power of the um, of the contractor. And then another example I came across recently was in the context of a of a retention bond. And so typically, retention bond should act in the same way as a on-demand uh, bond, and so it should be liquidated upon upon first demand. That is that is the, that was the intention, presumably. But in but in this particular case, what what this bond said was that it could be it could be uh, liquidated, provided that the uh, the employer's entitlement to the retention had crystallized under the underlying contract. And so this necessarily blurs the lines between the construction contract and the retention bond. And so to determine whether or not the employer is entitled to the retention monies, it's necessary to go into the construction contract and work out if these rights have actually accrued. That really does blur the distinction and, and, and it does really move away from the premise that an on-demand performance bond is distinct from the underlying contract. And so, so these are kind of um, negotiated terms, if you like, which, which can dilute uh, the on-demand uh, nature of a performance bond. The other, the other issue I just want to highlight uh, 
is the uh, ICC Uniform Rules for Contract Guarantees. And these rules have been around for maybe 30 years. And they were published by the ICC um, in recognition of the perceived harshness of a, of a pure on-demand performance bond because uh, concern was expressed that um, on-demand bonds can be called wrongfully. Um, and so, you know, maybe the contractor's done, done nothing wrong, but his bond has still been liquidated. And that causes all sorts, all sorts of problems. And so these, these, um, these, um, these rules are uh, an attempt to, uh, an attempt to maybe kind of mitigate, mitigate the, the harshness of a pure on-demand uh, performance bond. And you do see them increasingly in the market. And so it, it may be, you know, a typical on-demand performance bond, it, it will contain the, the typical governing law and dispute resolution clauses, but I'll say these are also subject to the uh, ICC, ICC uniform rules for uh, contract guarantees. And these do, these rules state various things, but a couple, a couple of issues I just want to kind of highlight are these. Uh, number one, before, in order to call a bond in these circumstances, it's necessary for the, for the employer to justify the reasons why he's seeking to liquidate the, the, uh, the bond. And the question of what kind of evidence is required is, is debatable. And there is, a, there is, a, there is a, a leaning, if you look at, if you look at the rules towards the, um, the employer providing some fairly conclusive evidence that the contractor is actually in default. And that's kind of moving an on-demand uh, performance bond more into the realms of a, a, of, a, um, of a default bond. And then the other kind of key issue I just want to highlight uh, is that before the issuer can actually pay out and pay the proceeds to the, um, to the employer, he's required to, to notify the contractor of this, of this payout. And so, so, this, so, this, so these, two, these two provisions uh, in tandem give the contractor an opportunity, a window of opportunity to actually seek an injunction because first of all, they've got time because they know the bond's going to be called. And second of all, they know the reasons or the basis upon which the, um, the employer is, is seeking to liquidate the on-demand performance bond. Once you have, once you've got, a, once you've got sight of, of a party's case, if you like, or their, or their position, it's always possible to raise to raise counter arguments and to and to you know claim or to, to argue that calling the bond would be wrong. And so and so the next so the next thing I want to talk to you about is how do you actually uh, seek an injunction? Um, and this this depends on a, on a case by case basis, depending on the jurisdiction uh, in which you're operating. Um, but by and large, the GCC jurisdictions uh, operate in a, in a similar way or, or in a comparable way. So taking the UAE as an example, and this, is, and these, this principle is generally applicable elsewhere across the GCC, is that under the, the UAE law, it's, 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 it's a codified provision that on-demand performance bonds should, should be liquidated unless there are exceptional circumstances. And so the question then becomes, what are exceptional circumstances? And that's left intentionally vague. So parties can argue on their merits, you know, whether that a bond, that a bond should be injuncted or, or restrained. Um, but, you know, traditionally, exceptional circumstances may be if, 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 calling the, if calling the bond would be an abusive act, or alternatively, if it would be manifestly wrong for the bond to be liquidated given the, given the, the relevant background circumstances. And had I been speaking to you maybe three, four years ago uh, on this topic, I'd have said it'd be, it's extremely difficult to get an injunction uh, to, to prevent an on-demand performance bond from being liquidated. But, you know, the market has changed and there's, there's, more, there's, uh, there's more willingness for, for courts to actually grant, in, grant injunctions. And we've been involved in a, in a couple, well, more than a couple, uh, several um, successful uh, applications for on-demand bonds to be injuncted. And to give you a little bit of flavor as to, as to the background, you know, the first one was when 
is a clear on-demand performance bond. But in this situation, we had evidence that the, uh, the employer had failed to comply with his uh, underlying payment obligations under the construction contract. And so that basis, it was oppressive and wrong for the, for the contractor to then liquidate the performance bond when he himself had failed to comply with his obligations under the contract. That's one example. Another example which came up recently uh, was a construction contract in respect of which there's no actual performance bond in place, but instead there was an advance payment guarantee. And so the employer was sought to, treat, sought to treat the advance payment guarantee as a de facto performance bond and sought to liquidate it on that basis. So, so leaving aside that the, the advance payment guarantee is there to guarantee the advance payment, not actual, not actual performance. The, the basis upon we got the injunction was that under the underlying construction contract, it said that the advance payment guarantee uh, can only be liquidated if the advance pay, to the extent that the advance payment is still outstanding upon termination of the construction contract. But in this situation, the construction contract hadn't been terminated. And also, even if you do issue a notice of termination, it was subject to a cure period of, of 30 days. And so on that basis, an injunction was obtained. But then even if you do obtain an, abjun an, an injunction, it's not, it's not the end of the story. Because typically, typically um, it's, it's, it's a temporary restraint and typically um, the, the, the applicant, the successful applicant, i.e. the contractor, is bound to file a, a substantive claim against the employer within a fairly short amount of time, typically eight days. And I think, you know, it's, it's a fairly kind of nuanced area issue of, of, of seeking and, and gaining uh, injunctions in, in this context. And I think this will probably be a, a topic for a, for a future, for future uh, webinar. Just the final point on, the, on, on this slide is, is assignment. And I've raised that because typically assignment is, is forgotten. And I've just got two points to make on that. First of all, if you are the, the employer and a new project is being uh, financed, it's, it's typical that the, uh, the funders would, would like the, the bond to, to, be, to be assigned uh, to them as part of their security package. So that, that should be addressed in the, in the performance bond. But equally, if you, if you are the contractor, you want to kind of keep track on who, on who the bond is actually, uh, who, uh, you do want to keep, uh, keep track on um, who the bond has been, has been assigned to. So, you know, as and when any attempts are made to call the bond, you can, you can act appropriately. So that, that concludes my, my discussion on performance bonds. And so if we can move to the next slide, please. So I'm just kind of conscious of, of the time. And so, so this next slide is about um, parent company guarantees. And I suppose in many ways, parent company guarantees are a kind of a, a belt and braces approach, which maybe kind of sit behind a, an on-demand performance bond. And I suppose, you know, the question is, you know, you know when would you actually uh, require a parent company guarantee? And typically you, you require a parent company guarantee if you've, if you're, an employer, if you're an employer and you've contracted with a, uh, uh, a subsidiary of a, of a larger company. So for example, you're, doing, you're carrying out a construction project in, in Saudi and um, you've contracted with a, uh, the uh, subsidiary of a, of a Singapore uh, holding company. Maybe the assets or the, or the capabilities of the Singapore subsidiary on the ground in Saudi aren't particularly robust, um, but there's a lot more strength behind the, um, uh, the parent company in Singapore. So in that situation, you, would look, you, may, you may wish to look for a, uh, a parent company guarantee. And so, and so the next kind of question is to look at the actual scope of the, of the parent guarantee. And so, you know, what, so the question is, what is the, the parent actually guaranteeing? Is he, is he guaranteeing kind of, kind of payment obligations or is he guaranteeing actual performance. Um, guaranteeing actual performance can be a little bit, can be a little bit difficult because you know, the parent in Singapore, for example, may not have the actual you know, capabilities on the ground in Saudi to actually perform construction obligations. And so in real terms, that would mean that the parent would have to kind of you know, pump resources um, and cash into the, into the Singapore uh, subsidiary in, in Saudi. 
or alternatively maybe the uh, the actual uh, obligations of the meeting to actually just making good payment obligations but then the other issue to look at as well is you know typically uh, a, pay, um, an under, um, a, uh, a parent company guarantee is activated by by breach uh, by, by, by the by the uh, by the breach of the of the subsidiary that kind of gets us back into the issue of what constitutes breach or, or default by the subsidiary. So as I said before, it's pretty important that what actually constitutes breach or default is clearly defined under the actual body of the, of the parent company guarantee. Um, yeah, look, a, a few other points. Um, parent company guarantees, there's been a lot, of, a lot of case law around parent company guarantees. Um, so parent company guarantees are drafting has, has evolved to uh, address case law, typically common law case law. And so it's typical to have various kind of kind of boilerplate provisions which really underline or underscore the fact that the, the parent company guarantees is, is a distinct obligation from the underlying construction contract. So regardless of, what, regardless of what's happened under the underlying construction contract, the parent company guarantee still remains intact. So even if the parent, so even if the underlying construction contract has been terminated, the, the parent company guarantee would still remain, it would still be enforced. Um, but then I think just a couple of concluding concluding points, uh, which are sometimes overlooked in, in my experience. Um, so to actually call or invoke a parent company guarantee, uh, it's not always a straightforward process because if you can, so rather than dealing with a non-demand performance bond, you're dealing with a bank and the bank should, like I said, should, should pay out relatively quickly. With a parent company guarantee, you're dealing with a, an actual company and companies have a processes to, to go through. And they may try to kind of you know, push back and, and argue certain provisions. So they can be quite difficult to actually, to actually invoke. And the other point is, it's important when negotiating and, uh, and agreeing a formal parent company guarantee to bear in mind the actual geographic location of the, of the parent company. So going back to my example of a, of a Singapore parent company, um, you know, there's probably not much much point um, suing this Singapore entity in the courts of Saudi because of the issues enforcing that judgment in, in Singapore, where, it, where presumably the parent company has its has, has its assets. So typically, it's um, be, be more prudent to provide that the parent company guarantee is governed by the laws of Singapore and subject to the maybe the jurisdiction of the courts of Singapore. But in that case, it's very important to take like to take local law advice. To ensure that the, the form of uh, parent company guarantee actually satisfies the local law requirements. Um, and so just kind of conscious of the time, this probably concludes uh, my part of the of the webinar. So I'll uh, pass back to to Andrew. Thanks, Ewan. Um, if you go to the next slide. Uh, but in the meantime, I mean, we're, we're, we're coming up to, to the end of, uh, of our time, but um, you and have, uh, well, obviously we've, we've asked for people to send in questions. Have, uh, I mean, maybe there's just time for, if there's one for me and one for you, and then I'll touch on the, the next event. Yes, I'm just, I had quite a few questions coming in. Uh, okay, I'll just take the first one. Um, uh -huh. First one for me is, uh, uh, whether or not I think that um, uh, default bonds may become more popular or more commonplace in the in the GCC, um, it's a good question. Um, default bonds are are used um, in other jurisdictions such as Asia uh, fairly frequently, and also in in Europe. Um, the market here is still very much an on demand performance bond market but but you know I, I you know I sense at the same time um, bargaining power in the Middle East is starting to equalize a little bit so I think you know kind of previously construction contracts used to be um, pretty one-sided in favor of the of the employer that kind of risk allocation is slowly starting to be redressed generally so I could see there is scope for uh, on demand for default performance bonds to find a uh, a place in the market going forward, but um, 
I still I still think it's it's going to be an on demand performance bond market for the foreseeable future. Um, I saw a question uh, for you, Andrew. So you know, if you've got a a a back to back a back to back clause, um, does this does this mean? Um, Sorry, just, just, just reading this question. Yeah, so, so in terms of back-to-back -back clause, um, how does that kind of, how does the whole thing kind of interface? So if a subcontractor's got a back-to-back -back clause and there's, um, it brings a claim against the, um, against, the main, against the main contractor, how would that kind of impact the main contractor's obligations going forward under, 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 the, under the main contract? So for example, in respect mm -hmm. of an extension of time, and if, for example, so I think, so for example, the just kind of reading the question again. So, for example, the uh, the delay. We're looking about extension of time. If the delay uh, has been caused by the by the main contractor, not by the subcontractor. Yeah, yeah, I think I know what you're talking. About. So, um, I mean, it comes up time and time again, doesn't it? They quite often main contractors, when they've included a back-to-back -back provision, think that that back-to-back -back provision absolves them from any liability for any delays. Now, um, usually a, a properly drafted back-to-back -back provision will make it clear that where there are delays which are exclusively caused by the main contractor, then the main contractor remains liable for, for those delays. Uh, the, the whole purpose behind the back-to-back -back clause is, is, is to allow the main contractor to pass through things that have been that um, in, in contractual terms it's liable to the subcontractor for but actually have been caused by the employer it's not supposed to go any further than that but many many main contractors think oh we, we have got this overall uh, protection um, now in some clauses uh, that that might work but of course it's it's uh, there, there is an inherent danger and, and many of you may have may have come across um, the the the, con the concept of the prevention principle. Now, I mean that's a concept straight out of common law, but it, it's reflected in in the GCC civil codes as well. And that is that a main contractor can't expect the subcontractor to perform its obligations if the main contractor is the reason why. The subcontractor can't perform. And so unless you've got a clause which allows for extensions of time because of the main contractor's default, the prevention principle basically suggests, or it is fairly clear, that the main contractor then won't be able to levy liquidated damages. So this is a thing that we, we, we come across time and time again, that in the, the pressure to impose onerous conditions onto the subcontractor, there is a failure to recognize that by making the provisions too onerous, they backfire and cause the main contractor to lose remedies, which it would have had if it had been more reasonable in its drafting or in its way that it interprets the contracts. So um, it, it's a it's an important point for both parties to recognize that back to back does not absolve the main contractor for the delays which it itself has caused, as opposed to delays which have been caused by the employer, which are then passed through the main contractor to, to the subcontractor. I hope that um, that clarifies the point. Um, no, is there anything, anything else, Ewan, from your side? Another question, or should we? We probably should wrap up because we've, we've we have just gone slightly over time. Well, let me just say yeah. thanks very much for attending. Uh, I hope you found that there was uh, some benefit there. In so far as um, you've, you've uh, asked questions which we haven't been able to answer, we, we will endeavour to to answer them. In terms of the next events. Um, the, the two topics which we're anticipating, and we, we like to have the idea of there being a, a continuous theme, um, but one of our uh, local litigation partners uh, is likely to be speaking about the, uh, about, about the uh, opportunities for obtaining um, 
injunctions on bonds in front of, in particular, the, the UAE courts. Uh, and then also uh, touching on a theme related to, to what I've, I've been talking about, uh, the applicability of uh, condition precedent procedure requirements in contracts and whether or not they are enforceable in the GCC. So th thank you again. Um, uh, I hope you uh, enjoy the remainder of your day. Some of you from the Far East and in Asia will probably be towards the end of your day now. Um, and we look forward to hosting you again uh, in the next event, which will be probably either the end of May or the beginning of June. Uh, we look forward to that. Thank you.